written recipes won't teach you to cook any more than having sheet music will teach you how to play piano. And for home cooks, there are 16 cooking rules that you should never follow, even if the cookbook or the TV show tells you to, because it's ruining your cooking. The 16 cooking rules that you should never follow, today on the Carefree Cook's Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cook's Code, every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cook's Code. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to the Carefree Cook's Code. Uh, this is the weekly show for the methods, techniques, and insights into better food and cooking. And we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern. Uh, you can find all the past shows in my video archive on Facebook. If you just go to facebook.com slash chef.todd.more slash videos. And if you want to see what I'm f cooking for dinner and how I did it, then follow Chef Todd Moore on Instagram as well. Uh, how do I do it? You might wonder. How do tens of thousands of other people do it? Well, they say this to themselves. Uh, I'm a carefree cook. I create my own recipes. It brings my friends and family together. I learn every time I cook. I create my own cooking style because I practice pro methods and I love my cooking. And here we are back together again. You know why, right? You know why we're back together? Yeah, we like each other very much. Okay, so beside that, the reason that we love spending 30 minutes together every Tuesday, it, it, it's... It's because there is yet another threat to home cooks that I've identified, right? We get together every week. It's not just because we like each other. It's because we want to progress. It's because we want to do something. And this week it has come to my attention once again that there is something that is ruining meals all over the world and I've got to make it stop. It's like the bat signal has been sent out and I'm here to rescue you today to save you from this terrible way of thinking in the kitchen. Uh, but first, we play a little game every Tuesday. It's either a true or false or a what am I. Today, I've got a true or false for you today. True or false, tell me in the comments section below. A chicken labeled roaster should be roasted. True or false in the comments section below. A chicken labeled roaster should be roasted. Hey, happy Tuesday, everyone. Uh, cool. Again, one of my favorite days of the week. You know I get really excited uh, when it's Tuesday and we get to talk again. Uh, but I also, I'm especially excited because I like the change of the seasons. And, and the seasons are changing here in downtown Baltimore. Uh, and, you know, when the seasons change, my cooking changes also. And, and if you've been with me live on these past Thursdays and Saturdays for the last six or seven months or so, you've seen that we've already started putting some of this into those live broadcasts, right? We're making some great soups. We're going to be doing that again. My favorite soup of all time we're going to be making this Saturday. Uh, we Last Saturday, we made butternut squash, right? So we're cooking with the fall ingredients already. Pretty soon, we're going to be making stews casseroles. We'll, we'll be making those uh, like warm cinnamon drinks, you know, apples, flavors like that. And we will not be going near the pumpkin spice. All right. I'm, I'm just, I'm so sick of hearing it. <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. But no matter how your cooking changes for the season, no matter what you decide to cook, I could tell you you're currently being misled. And, and I might even say that you're being lied to because there are a whole bunch of cooking rules, myths, misconceptions about how, cook, uh, how cooking works that have led home cooks down the wrong path for so many years. And I've identified these 16 cooking rules that might have been ruining your cooking 
all these years. Can you imagine it? Because there are 16 cooking rules that you should never follow. Want to hear them? Want to know what they are? Thumbs up? Heart? Love? Okay, I would do it anyway. <laughs> Even if you didn't give me thumbs up. So the first one, the first of the 16 rules is cooking by time. I, you know, this whole idea of cook for 20 minutes or, or saute for uh, three to five minutes. How do they know? How do they know how hot my stove gets versus their stove? How do they know what kind of pans I'm using? How do they know how thick my chicken breast is compared to their chicken breast? Wherever this recipe was written, it wasn't written in my kitchen. It's like, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. You know, the test kitchen is inherently different from my kitchen. Everything is different. All kitchens have unique qualities that make following recipes immediately difficult. And the first rule that you should never follow is time. If different pans were used at different heat rates, I mean, come on. It's, to me, it's too obvious. How can you ever cook by time? Common sense says that if one chicken breast is twice as thick as the other, the first one's gonna take longer to cook. And if all chicken breasts are different sizes, they're not made in a factory, you know? How can we cook by time? If all stoves heat differently, how can a recipe be written that commands you to cook by time? It's a rule to never follow. Cook with your eyes. Cook with recognizing the effects of heat on food, not with a clock. Rule number two that you do not have to follow is when you're told to look for a specific pan or a piece of ingre or a piece of equipment. I mean, oh my goodness, what if you don't have a casserole pan that is exactly nine by seventeen? Well, well, could you use your eight and a half by seventeen and a half inch pan? Could you use a, a nine by seventeen pan that's aluminum instead of glass? Can 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 you use a glass pan? Oh, it it, it makes people crazy, right? Does it even matter? Well, I mean, as soon as you know, all right, little differences. Glass is a poor conductor of heat, but it retains heat very well. So it takes a little while to get hot, but it also takes a little while to cool down. So this is great for casseroles to keep hot at the pot luck, but it's actually a detriment in baking. So the pan size is an indicator of the resulting volume you're gonna get, right? What the recipe is gonna yield. But you can use any size pan you want, and certainly a corn muffin recipe could be made into a corn bread recipe just by switching pans, right? Does that mean that the recipe will only work in a muffin pan? It, it's yeah, look, I don't listen to recipes that command a specific pan or a specific piece of kitchen equipment. It's a rule that I never follow. Rule number three is listening to these unquantifiable measurements and terms. You ever hear one onion chopped? Huh? Man, I've seen onions the size of grapefruits and I've seen onions the size of cherries. Given that range, exactly what is one onion? Tell me. <laughs> the best, the most wholesome ingredients, the ones that come from a farm, they are not consistent. They're all different sizes. So a recipe that calls for an ingredient of a relative size, it, you're instantly aligned for disappointment if you think that the amount of onion you put in even matters in the first place. Onions, garlic, uh, uh, peppers, celery, carrots, broccoli, even little pea-sized Peas <laughs> can be a range of sizes and the recipe never takes this into account. And even if I have an onion that I consider perfectly medium in some regard, I'll still use as much or as little as I want. As much as I like onions or I don't like onions. How can you be expected to cook just like the recipe when all the ingredients are the different sizes? Don't ever follow a recipe that has a rule about an amount that you can't quantify. Fourth rule, the vague warnings or instructions. They sound like cooking rules, but they're impossible to follow. Don't overmix. Don't overcook, <laughs> right? No kidding. I, do, uh, cook until done. I love that one. Cook until done. It, it, it's not that I love to overmix things. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to. It's not that my, I think my best food is overcooked. I'm just not sure what that means in a recipe. They don't ever seem to explain that. Overmixing is relative. 
in a yeast dough product, you want to mix for 20 to 30 minutes. You want to develop that gluten. But if you mix your cake for 30 minutes, it's going to be a chewy mess. You don't want to form the gluten. So being able to identify the visual cues of overmixing or undermixing are going to give you better results that you can then duplicate again and again. Any recipe that's going to contradict itself by saying something like, Mix, t mix eight to 10 minutes, but don't overmix. Well, <laughs> what is nine perfect? Is this like the Goldilocks formula? Which is it? Eight to 10. What if I mix for six and the batter already looks good? Can I stop or do I have to keep mixing for eight minutes? But then if it's not enough, can I go to 11? I mean, for goodness sake, I never listen to vague warnings from a written recipe. It's a rule to be ignored. Number five is about having to use a specific cut of meat or a specific ingredient. Look, I have control over the ingredients that I want to include in my cooking. If a recipe calls for onions, you know what I can do? Nah, I can use shallots. So there, all right? Chicken marsala can be made with boneless breasts or cube thigh meat if you want. Beef stroganoff, you can slice the beef. Uh, you can use a round cut. You, you can use flank steak if you want. It doesn't matter. I use the ingredients that I like most or, or just the ones I happen to have, right? That's where a recipe falls flat. Don't ever let a recipe command you to drive to the store, to buy more stuff, use what you have, and become familiar with the families of ingredients so that you can make up substitutions, right? Then you can get really creative. You could swap out spinach for escarole or, or escarole for spinach or carrots for daikon or, or if it calls for beef and you only have ostrich, Go for it, you know? Recipes are only one person's opinion of how something should be cooked. There, there's no rule forbidding you from changing the ingredients. Now, baking, like we've talked about, is precise in its ingredients, but you do not have to measure things in cooking. And this is the sixth rule that you can go ahead and ignore because your mouth is gonna tell you the truth. To experience true freedom in cooking, forget measurements. Don't, just don't worry about it. I know this is going to cause you heart palpitations. Your, your, your cooking should be guided by how your food looks and tastes, how it reacts to the heat and how you taste it. So in, in your desire to complete the dish as that recipe defines it, following it line by line, you're being distracted by the art of cooking. The more you look at the book, the less you look at the food. You're being distracted from enjoying, from developing your kitchen skills. So come on, will one tablespoon of soy sauce instead of a half tablespoon of soy sauce really ruin your dish? Is it gonna make that much of a difference? You've seen me make the very mistakes live with hundreds of people watching. I'm like, oh, formula calls for a tablespoon and you see me put two in didn't bother anything. Now, not if you if you like soy sauce twice as much as the recipe author, then that's exactly what you should do, you know? This obsessive concern over precise measurements in cooking is absolving yourself of the responsibility because you can always say the recipe didn't work. Wasn't that I was watching what was going on, it was the recipe's fault. But you know what? The recipe is never going to work exactly. It's up to you to interpret it. You're responsible for that recipe working or not. So take back control. Stop measuring. Don't follow this rule that takes away your creativity. Seventh, you don't have to use a brand name product. When a recipe commands you to use a specific brand name, just ignore it. I shop for ingredients for different reasons maybe than the recipe is telling me. You know, you pick up Cooking Light magazine, it's going to have a different approach to jambalaya than Zatarin's rice, you know, in there. Or they might be calorie conscious versus flavor conscious. The, the low cooking country website, you know, might put fat back <laughs> in versus Cooking Light. Look, be suspicious of any recipe that tells you to put a certain product in there. It really doesn't matter. 
Next, you can always ignore the order of ingredients in the recipe. Recipes love to do this. They confuse you in the order of cooking and the priority of the ingredients. Neither have anything to do with creating amazing meals. Changing the order of ingredients in, in cooking is one of the ways to control the final flavor and texture of the dish. I give you an example, the use of garlic. If you saute raw garlic in hot oil as the first step in your recipe, the garlic is going to be kind of subdued. It'll be a little sweeter. It'll be a little toasty, right? However, if you put minced garlic at the very end of the cooking, it's going to be sour. It's going to be pungent. But you get to decide the flavor you want in the creation. You, you don't have to set out for the same destination that the recipe is pointing you to. The eighth rule reminds me that I can change the path to success anytime I want. I can ignore the rule that tells me what order to put the ingredients in. Oh, we're halfway through. You didn't think there were that many, did you? <laughs> Everybody doing well? How am I doing? Am I getting through it? Is this blowing your mind a little bit? Can you hear your mom or your grandma telling you some of these things? Have you seen them written in a cookbook? It's okay. I know, everybody does it, everybody did it, we're a little different, they don't know any better. It's okay, but now we do, we know better. We can decide how and what to cook and what to eat, not be dictated by some ancient myths. So let's move on. Rule number nine has ruined more dinners maybe than any other. It's the rule that a recipe will tell you about cooking things together at the same time. I ignore this rule uh, because it defies logic, basically. Recipes that instruct me to saute garlic and onion, cook onion, celery, carrots together, misses the fact that these are different ingredients and they're being treated coldly the same. It's, it's disrespectful <laughs> to the food. Carrots are much harder than celery. Garlic cooks more quickly than onions in the same pan. And if I were to follow this rule, then I would always have burnt garlic and crunchy onions. You know, I always add the ingredients to anything I'm cooking separately, assuring that everything is to the exact level of doneness I want to preserve the nutrition, make it look the best, and then move on. That's why the best stir fry dishes use, utilize a combination blanching or par cooking procedure. So, you know, you, you steam the broccoli and then you stir fry it. You, you cook the carrots and then you add them. But any rule that tells me to combine ingredients takes away my ability to cook things well and I don't ever follow them. Uh, rule number 10, you can ignore too. Uh, and if you've been with me since uh, 2008 <laughs> online, when I first started teaching, you've heard me say it more than once. Don't cook with water. Water is the most flavorless thing on the planet next to air. You can't cook with air, I guess. I would not follow an instruction that advised to use water in a recipe any more than I would follow a recipe that told me to use air. <laughs> I always cook with broths and stocks. They add flavor to the cooking rather than remove flavor from your foods. That's what water does. Shrimp poached in water makes the water taste like shrimp and the shrimp tastes like water. It's that simple. Notice when you cook your carrots that the water is now orange. There's so much of the flavor and nutrition has exited the carrot into your water. You are going to drown in bland dishes if you follow a rule that tells you to cook with water. Uh, moving along, the 11th rule that you might be following by mistake, this is the command to season to taste in a recipe. Huh? Th this, is, this is where recipes just aren't leading you astray but they might actually be trying to kill you. I don't ever season or taste my dish until it's just finished. I've seen recipes that will have you tasting your marinade that had raw ingredients in it. It's just plain dangerous, you know? If your pasta sauce simmers for two hours, it's not gonna help you to, to taste it, to season at the very beginning through reduction, through evaporation of liquids. All these flavors are gonna change, they're gonna intensify. So this rule would have you putting basil and oregano into a pasta sauce and then simmering it for hours and you're gonna create a different flavor than you even started with. I create the dish for a specific flavor using the natural flavor of the ingredients, the tomatoes, the onion, the garlic, like that, 
early in the cooking process. The best ingredients, the most aromatic ingredients, but I season at the very end to make sure that it's balanced. Any rule that tells you to guess about the seasonings before the final dish is a useless rule. Number 12 would have you paying attention to the photo instead of the method of the cooking. Don't ever pay attention to a recipe photo. If you're trying to create the dish to look just like the photo, you're gonna be wasting a lot of food, just like they did in making this photo. I got news for you. The photo was taken in the photo studio by a food stylist, not a chef. The recipe was written in a test kitchen somewhere else and the two never meet. <laughs> you are going to be set up for poor expectations and massive disappointment if you think your cooking is supposed to look by the photo, like the photo. There is no rule that says that your cooking must look just like the photo. You can make up whatever you want. You needn't follow the photo. Similarly, you don't have to pay attention to the title of the recipe or the adjectives it uses. It's the lucky 13th rule that you should never follow is cooking for the title. Zesty chicken most of the time is not zesty <laughs> in my particular palate, right? Titles of recipes are more often descriptors that make the instructions sound exciting. They're, they're, they're marketing that make you try the recipe and they should not be confused with a guaranteed outcome. Quick and easy chicken most often is neither quick nor easy. And with the shortcuts taken to try and make it so, it probably doesn't taste much like chicken either. So recipe titles, they build your expectations falsely and this rule should always be ignored. We're almost there. This is exciting. <laughs> the, the oldest myth of all. I'm going to tell you the oldest myth of all in cooking is the next one coming up because rule number 14 would have you poking, guessing, and gashing items open to tell if they're done. There is only one way to tell quantifiably if your steak, your chicken, your pork, your fish, other, other, prote other protein product is cooked to your liking. It is not by poking it with your finger and then testing it against your cheek or your hand. It's ridiculous. It's preposterous. Everybody's hands and cheeks are different. How can then it be universal for the steak? Meaning that if you and I are side by side and you poke the steak and then poke your cheek or your hand and then I poke the steak and poke my cheek or my hand for doneness, yours is gonna be rare and mine's gonna be well done because I'm a leaner guy than you are, I, I don't know. A digital instant read thermometer, oh my goodness, it is the only way to quantify your cooking and tell when your items are done. You've heard me say it before, some people have that bed they have the sleep number bed, the adjustable feature. I don't care about my sleep number. I care about my steak number. You should have a personal quantifiable steak number. Mine is 128 Fahrenheit, about five degrees of carryover. Perfect for me. So ignore, please, this silly wives tale and get yourself a thermometer. Stop guessing and gashing. I shared one with you the other day. Cook until it's no longer pink. How are you going to tell that unless you gash it open, right? You just don't want to do it. Get yourself a steak number and know your safe final finish temperatures for chicken, pork, and fish. All right, so the next thing you want to forget about is number 15 is yields in a recipe. Serves six to eight people. Okay, did you know that the difference between six and eight is 25%? Immediately you have a considerable margin for error, 25%. Cooking 25% too much or 25% too little, it's don't ever believe recipe yields. You've got to know your family's basic portions. This is gonna empower you to ignore this rule of cooking. You, you'll, you'll ignore the yields on a recipe because you understand how much you're gonna cook no matter what. There are standard portions for the average adult. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. We, we get into great detail about it, so I'm not gonna go there now, but know your portions and ignore this recipe rule about yields. We're there, we're almost there and I made it on time, it looks. Lastly, the 16th cooking rule that you should never follow is using processed, altered, fake food products. Why bother cooking yourself if you're going to add engineered ingredients? True 
and enjoyable flavor of real foods cannot be duplicated and they cannot be sacrificed for some kind of false health goal. Using canned, jarred, low fat, engineered, low whatever, so many of these ingredients that are made in the lab have been shown to have the opposite effect of what they actually promise you to do. You're just so much better off eating real food, food that would have one word on the ingredient label, right? These fake foods, they actually make you crave more fat. They keep you hungry as your body tries to decipher what the heck you just ate. Half the amount of real butter will have four times the true flavor as twice as much margarine. You are never gonna get there with margarine the way you would with just a dot of butter, right? These composed, these, these processed meats, the, the formed chicken cutlet patty, they're, they're usually loaded with salt and fillers. Uh, they give you basically less than 100% meat in your meat. And you know, additionally, cooking is a scientific endeavor. Fats are used in saute to transfer heat to the pan, to the ingredients. And fats have different smoke points. They, they break down at different temperatures. They can render bad flavors. Margarines, they, they burn quickly. They just shouldn't be used in saute. Get your benefits somewhere else and use a little bit of butter. Fake meats are not gonna render fats for a flavorful saute or for the basis of a gravy. So the rule of using fake ingredients as an endeavor toward health or convenience or even, even cost should be absolutely ignored. It, it's gonna backfire on you, I'm telling you. And you know, the recipe card deck <laughs> is stacked against you. I mean, we've all had recipes that just don't come out right. You know, oh, that recipe didn't come out right. Well, it's because the rules that they present are inconsistent. They're vague, they're unquantifiable, they're variable, they're wasteful, they're disappointing. I mean, if your mom or grandma didn't teach you how to cook, take you by the hand and show you the methods of the way that they do it, well, unfortunately, you've been left to recipe books and celebrity chefs on TV. And the problem is that neither of these people actually teach how to cook. The Food Network is the MTV of food. MTV used to play music. Now they're entertainment about music. The Food Network is entertainment about food. They don't teach anybody to cook. But I've seen the change made in thousands of people's lives when they learn how to cook, capital H, how, how to cook. I'm not talking about following recipes or spending a bunch of money on cookbooks. I mean, you will find the great freedom in understanding the basic methods that go into cooking. When you learn how to saute, then you can use chicken or shrimp or tofu or beef or vegetables. It all remains the same. Being able to cook by method means you never have to stress out, figure out what's for dinner tonight because you always cook with the ingredients on hand. You will never have the frustration of written recipes not working. You'll, you'll save the money from the takeout food. You'll improve your nutrition. You'll gain a new hobby. You might reunite your family, entertain for friends, gain confidence, eat a greater variety of food, all while developing a skill for an entire lifetime. Do you know why I'm so excited about this? That's why. But I want you to ignore these antiquated and misleading rules of cooking. Learn how cooking works. And then a whole new lifestyle will open up for you. All right, let's get back to the true or false for today. What'd you, what'd you think in the comments? If a chicken is labeled roaster, that's an indicator of age, uh, not how to cook it. The answer is false. If a chicken says roaster, th th that's a, a label that means that the bird was between eight and 12 weeks of age of either sex and weighed at least five pounds. It's an industry label. It's not a cooking suggestion. <laughs> so do you know someone who might be following these ancient antiquated cooking rules and they're just not sure why? Well, if you do, please like, love, share.
Like, love, share this video with those people so they can become truly free in their cooking as well. And you know, speaking of pride, there is nothing more pride provoking in the kitchen than being able to come up with an endless number of dinner ideas at a moment's notice. And if you'd like to know how I do it, how I get five times more variety and five times more flavor into my cooking, I'm going to share this powerful pro practice with you so you can get the same results. Go to webcookingclasses.com slash five times and grab this free class. Pick a time that's right for you. So until next Tuesday, uh, until we uh, meet again at noon Eastern, uh, look, I want you to be a bit of a rebel this week. Yeah, throw it down. How many cooking rules that you've been following, but you don't know why you've been following them, can you break this week? Be a rule breaker. Do it until next Tuesday. And remember, there's always a method to your cooking success.